So we are very uh, fortunate today to have um, John Mueller and um, Mark Stewart with us promoting their uh, new book, uh, Chasing Ghosts. Um, John Mueller is a senior uh, fellow at the Cato, is Cato, kind of? Um, he's a member of the uh, Political Science Department and Merchant Center International Security Studies at Ohio State University. Um, he also wrote um, extensively about um, the um, public opinion and reactions to terrorism and how it is related to risks and benefit, um, most notably his uh, book, Terror Security and Money, Balancing the Risks, Benefits and Cost of Homeland Security. I love long titles because they really summarize it very well. Um, Mark Stewart, the uh, second speaker uh, today, um, who is the co-author of the uh, Chasing Ghosts, um, the Policing of Terrorism, um, the cover of which, of which you can see behind me, is a professor of civil engineering and director of the Center on um, uh, Infrastructure Performance and Reliability at the University of Newcastle in uh, Australia. He's the co-author of Chasing Ghosts, as I said. Um, and um, he's also um, has uh, 25 years of experience in probabilistic risk and vulnerability assessment of infrastructure and security systems, um, which is a nice way to say that he gets to think about and see and plan a lot of uh, destruction, um, and it is entirely societally sanctioned. So he's very lucky um, indeed in that sense. I also wanted to say that um, from the um, center of, on terrorism point of view, and from John Jay's um, perspective in general, it seems to me that the uh, timing could not be better for um, these two guys to talk about their books. And, um, a, and the uh, book publication is really uh, perfectly timing in the sense that we now see um, a lot of evidence for the reactions, the popular reactions, the uh, military reaction, and also um, 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 governmental and all the way in between to terrorism. Um, and I think it is a, um, a very good opportunity for us to, as an academic institution, to stop and reflect about the, um, the risks and the benefits and the costs and, the, um, and, um, and everything that goes into this rather um, emotionally driven process that could be made slightly more rational. And I think that this is what you will hear um, today. So, uh, John Mueller, please. Okay, thank you, it's really great to be here. Um, I may just add something on the introduction. Mark and I uh, met basically because of John Stewart and The Daily Show. Um, my first book on terrorism is called Overblown. And, uh, in some respects, you'll be hearing more about that now. Um, and Mark just, and I would, it was invited on the John Stewart Show on Halloween, which I thought was really an appropriate time to talk about um, fear and, and terrorism. Uh, and Mark happened to be visiting Ohio State at the time in the engineering department. Um, and uh, along with his wife, is also an engineer. And uh, he said he'd been doing some work in this general area applying risk analysis to terrorism, and we ought to meet, so we did. And the result of that has been uh, not only Chasing Ghosts, but the previous book, Terror, Security, and Money, and about 30 peer-reviewed articles and a whole bunch of um, uh, op-ed pieces, and we even got one in Playboy, which he constantly footnotes. He may, he may, he may be the first engineer ever to appear in in, uh, in uh, Playboy, except possibly in the centerfold. Neither of us made that. Um, okay, what I'd like to do, uh, the, 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 the thrust of this is basically to apply standard risk analysis techniques, which are used in the government and other places, uh, to the hazard of, secure, of, of uh, terrorism. And I, I'd sort of like to, what I'd like to do is talk about what the threat is, what the perception of threat is, both official and in terms of public opinion, and also what it seems to be. And then Mark will talk about how you would apply risk and analytic procedures and cost-benefit analyses to this uh, problem. Um, let me begin with these, this quote um, uh, from, uh, uh, from this very island. Uh, Rudy Giuliani saying that anybody, any one of these security experts, including myself, would have told you on September 11th, we're looking for dozens and dozens of multi-years of attacks like this. Uh, all those security experts clearly were wrong. I should point out that 9-11 stands out as, 
the worst terror, not only the worst terrorist attack in history, but by a margin of about 10. That is to say, there's been scarcely any terrorist attack inside a war zone or outside a war zone before 9-11 or after 9-11 that has inflicted even one-tenth as much damage. So the, the, it remains an extreme outlier and also obviously an extreme tragedy. Um, okay, now the question is, after 9-11, after people are thinking there must be terrorists everywhere, um, how, do you, how do you sort of nail it down? How do, you, how do you police it? Which is the main topic of the book, the policing measures. The uh, terror security and money was more dealing with infrastructure protection. Should you protect infrastructure, bridges and buildings and things like that? Um, and uh, there are a couple of quotes that are in the book. One is uh, from George W. Bush who says, the FBI director informed me that there were 331 potential Al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States. He's writing this book in 2010 and he, he states that and he never bothers to say, wait a minute, none of those 331 operatives ever showed up. Where were they? Uh, and similarly, Michael Morrell for the CIA, who's now a consultant all over the place, uh, talking about the aftermath of 9-11, there was an avalanche, literally thousands of intelligence reports uh, in the months following 9-11 that indicated that Al-Qaeda would kick, hit us again, uh, and they might use chemical, biological, nuclear devices. Uh, he's writing that in 2015, and he never bothers really to say, what happened? What, were all those reports wrong? And essentially, they were. Uh, the to uh, the um, in 2000 um, and uh, then in, in 2002, uh, intelligence officials were telling uh, uh, selected reporters, ones that had good access to them, <coughs> that their calculation were that there were about between two and five thousand operatives, Al Qaeda operatives, at, at loose in the United States. Uh, the correct number is either zero or else they're all still there, just waiting, you know, watching porn, uh, doing drugs, and waiting for a time to actually strike, or to be caught the longer they wait. Anyway, they haven't shown up. The, the total number of Al-Qaeda agents that have been in the United States since 9-11, depending on how you define it, might be five or seven or something like that, um, and, and probably less. Uh, uh, so it's, it, they were just, they were seeing ghosts. They were seeing two to 3,000. We hear them talking to each other, they said, um, and they simply didn't exist. Um, and in 2005, uh, Robert Mueller, the director of the FBI, said, what really bothers me, uh, I'm very concerned about what we're not seeing. At the same time, the FBI issued a report, uh, it was secret, but it was leaked to ABC News, that they're unable to identify a single true Al-Qaeda sleeper cell anywhere in the country, uh, a situation that remains true 10 or 11 years later. Uh, if the FBI, however, was telling me the Fox News, and this, I'll return to this issue in a bit later, just because there's no con concrete evidence of a sleeper cell doesn't mean they don't exist. So, uh, you know, they could be there and we just can't find them. Um, okay, in the meantime, uh, this is from a really interesting book by Arkin and Dan Dana Priest of the Washington Post, The Top Secret America, this fantastic intelligence operation that's basically been created. Let me call your attention to the third point there. There have been 200, there are 263 uh, um, counterterrorism organizations were either created or reorganized after 9-11. The total number of terrorists that have been caught in the United States, plan to damage in the United States, is about half that. So the United States has created two entire organizations for every terrorist arrest it's been able to, to affect, essentially, or plus or minus. Um, the, um, and also, what, one of the things that that kind of initial mentality caused was something called the threat matrix. Uh, in which every tip, every lead that came into the public, uh, into the, um, into the uh, intelligence and policing apparatus had to be followed up. Uh, and this gives you some quotes from a book by uh, Garrett Graff about, about them, uh, the, the, they, they were tracking unfolding terrorist plots and, and uh, basically everything was in there. Every lead had to be followed up. Um, the, uh, and, uh, and here's, uh, the threat matrix is basically a book that or a computer book presumably that is shown to the director of the FBI, the director of the FBI, uh, the FBI and the CIA, as well as the president, every, basically every day. Uh, and it's a collection of every tip. They call it threats, but what they are is tips. And you've got a zillion tips. If you see something, say something, a lot of people are saying something. Um, so there's zillions of tips. Uh, a graph quotes one of the tips, and this is what it would say in a threat matrix. We have a threat from the Philippines to attack the United States unless blackmail money was paid. And then you say, okay, what's that based on? Well, it's based on the following email. Uh, Dear America, I will attack you if you don't pay me $99999999, moo-ha-ha-ha. 
um, and coming from the Philippines. So they had to follow this up. And uh, it's obviously by uh, somebody in the Philippines, and they contact the Filipino police, and the police eventually were able to get to the would-be terrorist parents uh, and told them to tone it down a bit, well, you, and apparently has. So and everything is there. Everything is just thrown in. There's a lot of uh, tips that are basically ways to get my, you know, their, their ex-husband or ex-wife in trouble and so forth. My ex is a communist, and he's also a terrorist, and he's also a prevert and things like that, but you have to follow them up. Uh, the result of this is, uh, according to a graph, that the government chases upwards of 5,000 threats every day, tips every day. If each of those takes about two years, on average, two days to run down, that would mean since 9-11, the, the FBI and other government agencies have followed up 10 million leads since 9-11. The number of these that has led to anything is probably less than 1,000, and much of the things that they've led to has been pretty, pretty trivial. Uh, however, that number may be wrong because according to Peter Bergen, who I think you had speaker fairly recently on this new book, excellent book, though I disagree in part here and there, as you'll soon find out, um, there, there were actually about 10,000 FBI investigations going on simultaneously. If that's true, that means that since 9-11 they followed up 20 million leads, of which almost certainly less, less than 1,000 led to anything fairly serious, and much of that was not very serious, but at least there was something there. Um, so um, there's um, uh, George Tenet, the director of the FBI, talks about seeing these things every day, all these, quote, threats in the list, and they change every day, of course. And he said, virtually every day you would hear something about a possible impending threat that would scare you to death. Jack Goldsmith, um, who has, uh, came in later, said, uh, this captures the attitude, what he, he quotes what I just quoted you, uh, the, the, the um, Tenet statement, this captures the attitude of virtually every person I knew who regularly read the threat matrix. In other words, all these people are being every day scared to death by this, by this, this listing of impending threats. Um, and he also concludes that the want of actionable intelligence, in other words, hardly anything these lead to anything meaningful, combined with the knowledge of what might happen, imagine, you know, we're going to have multiple 9-11s that might happen, um, produce an aggressive panic attitude that assumed the worst about the threats. No one basically saying, maybe there aren't any, maybe there isn't much out there. That, that would be perfectly plausible. The reason there isn't actionable intelligence is there isn't anything to have actionable intelligence about. In other words, largely, you're chasing ghosts. Um, okay, um, let me turn to the second point, which is looking at uh, some effort to try to evaluate how, big, how much the threats are, both disclosed and not disclosed. These are two quotes from Peter Bergen's bo book. Um, and he, the book is really, uh, well, you heard him talk about it, is really quite good. I've enjoyed it a lot. It's really helpful and interesting and extremely well put together. Um, but uh, he routinely, or it just sort of gives credit to the, the fact that there haven't been any top plots. Uh, uh, there hasn't been much happening in terms of terrorism in the United States. He has um, 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 credit for that, the policing and intelligence initiatives. They dramatically reduced the threat posed by terrorists. There are 16 people on the no-fly list, now there are 40,000. That might seem a tad excessive. Uh, there are 32 joint terrorism and fusion centers. Uh, uh, he's got that a little bit confused. The fusion centers have basically done nothing, as far as I can see. The JTDFs have, perhaps. A decade and a half later, there are more, there are more than 100. It's impossible to measure the impact of programs designed to prevent attacks. Uh, the relatively small number of successful jihadist attacks in the United States does not indicate that the American defense measures are working. Um, and he also says that measuring the, the success is, is uh, as with gauging success of preventive law enforcement, almost impossible. How can you measure something that didn't happen? Okay, what I'd like to do is take that challenge and try to at least get some sense of uh, what's out there. Uh, first of all, uh, if you want to look at what the terrorism threat has been to the United States, um, what you can do is look at the disclosed cases. People have been captured or arrested and then brought into the courts um, and uh, uh, convicted. Uh, the, the, and and it's, so it's, it's a, obviously an open court situation, so we know about them. Um, I've done a case study book uh, called Terrorism Since 9-11, which, which is now about 850 pages of, uh, case of each of these case studies. It's now under its whatever, its sixth edition, just came out in 2016 in which I work with honors students who are really very good um, at Ohio State, uh, have them produce uh, case studies of each of the cases that have come to light, the ones that have been revealed. Um, and this is uh, an indication of, of what the cases are. Uh, up through the Boston Marathon, I'll talk about the one since the Boston Marathon in a second. 
but uh, what frequently happens is, uh, as for example in the Bronx Synagogue case, uh, not too far from here, um, is that uh, it's, when you look at the cases, it's not clear these guys on their own would ever have been able to do much of anything. And Bergen talks about that as well in his book. Uh, a prime case in instance is basically the judge in the Bronx Synagogue case saying, these guys are utterly inept and on an, uh, a fantasy t terror operation. Only the government could have made a terrorist out of the plot, plot, plot's leader whose buffoonery is positively Shakespearean in scope. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, I mean, that's an extremely strong statement, this is her public statement, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that there would have been no crime here except the government instigated it, planned it, and brought it to fruition. Not necessarily put the, mind, the, the idea in the, plan, in, the, in the minds of the plotters, but basically made it work and gave them the money to do it. Um, and that you come up with that in not all cases, but many cases as well, that these guys basically, they, they talk the talk, they talk the jihadist talk, they're believers in that sense, they weren't complete innocents, but they basically getting their act together was, would be very difficult. Um, and uh, these cases here with the arrows are all the ones in which informants have been a part of the plot, not simply looking at it, but actually joining it up, play acting, uh, and covering it in that way. Um, and these are the plots, uh, as you can see, even more of these have arrows. These are the plots that have been disrupted uh, since, uh, since the Boston Marathon over the last year. As you can see, there's a huge number in 2015, um, mostly in inspired by ISIS. Let me just give you, give you one example here, which is the last one, the Rochester Panhandler. Um, this was a guy who really wanted to join ISIS, and he, he talked to somebody who said, well, you have to do something to prove your bona fides, as it were. Uh, and so he was going to get a machete and attack a Rochester airport. He was a member of a terrorist cell of four. The other three were all FBI operatives. Um, and uh, so they took him to Walmart where he could buy a, buy a, a machete. Uh, he didn't have any money, so the FBI informant had to buy it for him. And then he was going to go hack at people in the Rochester air, uh, airport, every Rochester restaurant. And, and then, of course, he's arrested. That kind of thing is fairly common. Many of these guys might actually eventually have done some damage, but the amount of damage was likely to be really pretty low. Um, okay, um, if, you, if you look at what the terrorist adversary is, this is an official statement by the Department of Homeland Security. The enemy is relentless, patient, opportunistic and flexible, shows an understanding of the potential consequences, etc., uh, knows about targets and tries to weaken the economy and damage public morale and confidence. Relentless, patient, opportunistic and flexible. Um, well, uh, and that's the entire statement about, in this, in this major document, about what the terrorist, the nature of the terrorist, quote, adversary, unquote, is. Uh, no, no, nowhere do they say on the, on the next sentence, of course, a lot of them are knuckleheads. Um, and, and so they just leave this to, to lie there, like they, they're all Moriarty's or something. Um, but when uh, it, the uh, students were asked basically to characterize the people in their plots, these are the kinds of words that they came up with, they came up with or to use a somewhat, um, uh, uh, another way of putting it by Brian Jenkins, who's been studying this thing intensely at, at the Rand Corporation for 30 or 40 years. Their numbers are, uh, numbers are remain uh, small, uh, their determination limp, and their competence poor. And that pretty much sums them up. That, it's not that there's no danger, obviously there have been some plots that have been successful and killed uh, people, uh, three people per year essentially have been killed. Uh, by terror, Muslim terrorists since 9-11. That's three too many, but it's still an extremely small number. Without the policing, you can imagine this would have been somewhat higher, but it's not likely to be astronomical by any means. Okay, so that's, um, uh, and you might, if you haven't seen the movie Four Lions, uh, I certainly recommend it. It's, it's fairly typical. I can talk more about that later if you want. Um, it's, a, it's a dark comedy that coming, uh, done by um, uh, a director in Britain. Um, okay, so that's the disclosed terrorists within the United States. Now, the next question is, what about undisclosed terrorists? Uh, what are they like and how many are those? Um, a lot of uh, uh, people are being told at times by intelligence and policing agencies that if we could only tell you about all the plots we actually have, there are a bunch of things we were able to disrupt, but for some reason or other, we can't possibly tell you about them. We've tried to find it out, and more importantly, perhaps other people have. So, for, so Dana Priest, for example, whenever she was doing her book, said we asked them to share with us anything they could, plots that have foiled that we could have put in the paper, because we could put in the paper because uh, it just we, we, didn't, we needed some examples, for example. We said, uh, give us things, just generalities, but we didn't receive anything back. 
Mark Sageman, um, who uh, uh, emailed me this, um, uh, we've had quite a few conversations on this issue, as a member of the intelligence community who kept abreast of the, the plots in the United States, I have not seen any significant terrorist plots that have been disrupted and not disclosed. And, and on the contrary, the government like, likes to go out of its way to take credit for non-plots, such as their sting operations. I've also talked to uh, Glenn Carl, who used to be former, who used to be Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Transnational Threats, about these undisclosed threats, and his response was basically fairly uh, straightforward. Um, the um, okay, so so I think basically that's that's not the case. However, some of the plot there there have been guys who seem to be proto-terrorists, and I was talking the talks and so forth but they can't be convicted on a terrorism charge because they haven't gone far enough. So instead what happens is the FBI and other policing agencies have sought to uh, get rid of them. Uh, but they can't arrest them on terrorism charges because they, they don't have enough evidence that they would. If they did, they would use that, obviously. So they instead they used the Al Capone approach where he was convicted on income tax evasion, not of being a gangster, because they couldn't prove the gangster thing, but they could prove the income tax evasion. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of these as well, uh, probably well over 100 uh, uh, people. Um, but the, the issue in this case is you've got people who are even more embryonic than most of the disclosed uh, cases. Most of the disclosed cases are very, uh, you know, people didn't have weapons. They didn't know how to use weapons. They were thought of, they had planned to take down a synagogue or to topple the Sears Tower or so forth, uh, but uh, they didn't know, didn't know how to set off a bomb. Uh, much less set, up, set off a missile or even a shoot a gun particularly. Uh, and so these ones were even more primitive than that. Now some of these, if they've been left alone, might have gone into a higher realm of uh, uh, development, but most probably would have fizzled away. Instead what these guys have been, they've been convicted on you know, money laundering or on doing, dealing drugs or they've been, or on immigration violations and sent out. Um, so there, this, this is a, a collection of undisclosed cases in some sense. They're disclosed in the sense that they obviously had to go through the judicial process, but not particularly on direct terrorism charges. Uh, and there's a fair number of those, but they seem to be even more primitive than the ones that have been disclosed. Uh, the other two categories are the deterred. Uh, maybe, and that's is of course what uh, Bergen is talking about, Maybe there's a lot of cases of people who want to do terrorism, but because of the security apparatus, were deterred from doing so. And I find that a questionable argument. I think it, it's very fair to say that the terrorists, uh, that certain targets are so secure that any terrorist that wants to attack them has probably been deterred. One of the, and Mark will be talking about this as well, one of these is um, um, uh, the uh, airlines. It's just really hard to take down an airplane because of all these layers of security. Military bases are also quite secure, and that's a really favorite uh, attack um, uh, target of the, of the jihadists because their main motivation, radicalization, if you want to call that, is outrage at American and military and foreign policy in the Middle East. So attacking a military target, like a military base, would be the kind of thing they'd like to do, and that's very hard when they do it. It's, it tends to be like recruiting stations within cities, which of course are not nearly as hard um, as those. So it's reasonable to think that they, a lot of terrorists have been deterred from attacking certain targets. <coughs> but the problem is that there are an infinite number of targets as we saw in San Bernardino, or as we saw in Paris, or as we saw in, in Brussels. Um, so the fact that you can't attack an airplane, if you're a jihadist, you, you find another target. If you want to kill a bunch of people, you can get fabulous publicity from it. Uh, you can be, you know, as as has been as as happened with those cases I mentioned. Uh, you don't have to take down an airliner. So the 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 deterred argument is they got this terrorist. Said, I really want to be a terrorist. I want to take down an airplane. Okay, I can't take down an airplane, so I'm not going to be a terrorist. As opposed to trying to find a different target. The same thing holds with the we've only caught the dumb ones and the smart ones are still out there. And if the smart ones are out there, why don't they do something? Are they waiting to get caught? Uh, the longer the wait, the more likely that is. So that's uh, sort of our um, Im impression on that. Um, and this is a statement by the anthropologist Scott uh, Atran, which I think fits very well. Never perhaps, and in, in, now let me finish the talk by talking about my presentation by talking about public opinion. Uh, this, this statement seems to be very true in terms of not only the 9-11 impact, but its continued impact. Um, the, um, you know, let's skip that, okay. 
Uh, what I've done, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's in the book with Mark, and we've, we've also done a separate paper more recently, is try to trace trend lines in public opinion since 9-11. And there's dozens of these. They're all basically posted online. I'm just going to show you two. Uh, the bottom line, however, is they don't change. They haven't changed since 9-11. Uh, th this is a question, quite a good, uh, fair question. Do you think, uh, are you worried that you, that um, uh, there would be another terrorist attack causing large numbers of Americans to die uh, in the near future? After 9-11, about 70%, 72% were worried, uh, said they were very or somewhat worried about that. It's gone up and down with various events, and as you can see, even before the rise of ISIS, it was still at 70%. The ISIS thing comes in here. This is Paris 1 and Paris 2. So even here, before ISIS, it was still at the same level, basically, as after 9-11. The other pattern is more this one, which is there's some change in 2001, but not much since. And this is a good way to look at it, because this, this question was formulated when Timothy Bay uh, launched what was then the worst terrorist attack in American history, the blowing up of a building in uh, office building in, uh, in Oklahoma City in 1995. They ask this question, which is, again is a very easy to understand question. It's not complicated. Uh, or how worried are you that, or that you or someone in your family will become a victim of terrorism? Uh, at, at the time of the Oklahoma City attack, it was about 42 percent. We said they were very or somewhat worried. And as you can see in this period, it was obviously plummeting very far down. At the time of 9/11, it shot up to 60 percent. Uh, and then by the end of the year, it come down to around 40%. It's bounced around because of events and so forth, but as you can see, it's basically stayed the same. Again, even before ISIS uh, in, in, this, in this period, roughly in the same area. So that hasn't changed at all. Um, okay, um, let me, I won't go through these in detail, but the, um, we came up with a bunch of reasons why you would expect there to be erosion of fear about uh, uh, terrorism after 9-11. Uh, is Mark's idea is to put numbers on them. It's more impressive. So we got 13 of them. Um, and one is, for example, the low objective likelihood of being killed by a terrorist. Uh, why should 40% of the people say they're worried about it when their chance of being killed is, at, at worst, one in four million per year? Uh, Mark will talk more about this later, but your chance of being killed by a terrorist since 9-11 in the United States is about one in 80 million per year. Should you be worried about that? Um, and there's, you know, there haven't been attacks, there have been large attacks, there have been much only a small attacks, the number of people killed, as I mentioned earlier, is about three per year. Um, also, and, the, and we also got the death of bin Laden, um, and which should have done something, you'd think. Uh, and also, uh, technically, it's interesting because the questions usually have layers so that you can actually move down. You're, you don't, you're not asked, are you worried? Uh, how worried are you? Worried or not worried at all? Instead, you can say, I'm somewhat worried, I'm very worried, I'm not worried, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, mostly not worried, and so forth. You can go from saying, I'm very worried, to I'm somewhat worried, and you're still worried, right? So you haven't really changed, but, but, you, but you can move down without having to say you're not worried at all. And you can say, uh, you can move from, I'm somewhat worried, to not too worried. So you can still, you don't have to say you're not worried at all. So it's easy enough to move up and down on that scale, uh, and uh, that hasn't happened. Um, the, uh, yeah, we're skip here. This is, uh, this is from uh, Spectre, uh, the very scary uh, Ju Judy Dench, but I don't have time to go there. If you want to see the whole thing, I'll be glad to do it. Um, oh, wait a minute, let's see. Did I miss something? Yeah, oh, wait, this is what I want to do. Uh, so we've, basically, these are the reasons we come up as why there might be a might have been a decline. Uh, to explain why there hasn't been a decline, uh, obviously 9/11 was very traumatic, and, and it was followed up by the anthrax attacks, which probably added a, another dimension to it. Um, there's the uh, number two, the the, uh, the fact that the uh, the fear was they could turn out weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear ones, because they're so good at box cutters, um, and uh, that. And that number three is basically that they're out to kill as many people as possible and do so more or less at random. But that doesn't distinguish them from Timothy McVeigh. That was basically a random act. He didn't, you know, just picked a building. Um, and, uh, and he was trying to kill a lot of people and did. Um, so the, the bottom two are the ones we sort of, I at least am inclined to hone in on. 
One is that there's a constant reminders because of these small, the cases I talked about before, or news about them uh, popping up. They don't, usually it doesn't last very long, but people are constantly being reminded that the terrorists are still out there. Uh, and then the last one, which I'd like to, and I'd really like your opinion on this sort of stuff because this, this still strikes me as being a bit murky. Uh, the the Islamist, terrorism, Islamist terrorism seems to be part of a large and hostile conspiracy and network that is international in scope and rather spooky. Um, the uh, Timothy Gay was not spooky, uh, and, and the concern obviously dropped off after that. Uh, but um, it seems to be that one possibility is that they're just sort of a, 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 a something way out there. The comparison I would make with this is not with terrorism, other terrorism, but with communist, domestic communists during the Cold War. I'll get past Judy Dench again, sorry about this. Uh, for example, J. Edgar Hoover during the Cold War said, the American Communist Party is working to undermine the country and so forth. And uh, the second paragraph, is, it's in progress and virtually invisible to the non-communist eye. Really, really spooky stuff. So what you had was a bunch of communists in the United States who seemed to be out to destroy democracy and, terror and, ca and capitalism. Um, who you couldn't tell who they were. And in fact, they were virtually invisible to the non-communist eye, which presumably means also to F the Eric J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. So that kind of spookiness and connected to an international thing that was centered in Moscow and Beijing perhaps, but it was out there, was very much there. And what's impressive um, is that, um, let me skip this, well, give Mark some time here, and I'll end on this. Um, this um, it shows you the press attention to domestic communism during the Cold War. It was extremely high in the early 50s uh, with the Korean War with a uh, very uh, couple of spy, uh, communist, domestic communist spy cases, the Rosenberg case and the um, His Chambers case. Uh, and there's a lot of press attention to it. Thereafter, however, it dribbled off uh, more, uh, very much. The, again, this is the red thing on top. The number of items on communism or communism U.S. Not international communists, not the Cold War, but kind of domestic communists uh, in the in the country um, that, that uh, were in the uh, in uh, literature indexes. And as you can see, it dropped off to the point where you get to the 1970s that there's virtually nothing about it because the party isn't doing anything. In fact, it's mostly filled with FBI agents, uh, so there's no press coverage. Nevertheless, the uh, the percentage of people holding it to be uh, a great or very great danger, which is about 40 percent, 10 years later had only gone down a few percentage points, and even 20 years later, when there was no reminders, basically, it was still at about 30%. So, and, and so they were not being egged on by the press, because the press wasn't covering it. Um, and uh, nonetheless, it, it lingered very slowly. So it seems to me that's the kind of mechanism that may well be uh, at work here. So let me end on that distinctly non-cheerful note and turn it over to Mark. While well, he's working that up, I might have one additional point on that. Uh, communism could come to an end, right? Uh, eventually it could be destroyed and people would become convincing, convinced that it didn't exist. But terrorism can't. And this can always be like they're murdered. There's always going to be murder. So that it may uh, be additionally depressing. Okay, uh, John is normally a fairly tough act to follow because uh, I tend to talk about equations and the numbers, the uh, most exciting thing in the world. But um, let's just think, think about the motivation for this, is, is that you know, my background is really you know, risk assessment, and that's really to help make the decisions. And so, so when I think about risk, I like to put numbers to it, I like to quantify it. You know, even, if it's, even if it's not that accurate, but it's, it gives you a ballpark number, that's a basis for, for, for a rational discussion about is it too high, is it too low, maybe we tweak this or, or, or tweak that. Um, many security conferences I go to is a lot of arm waving and you know, threats of evolving the adaptive and everything else, but they don't actually get down to just how is risk, risk changing. And the motivation really is if we're, going to, if we're going to have these security measures, then how effective are they? What is the benefit? Uh, and these measures are normally, re are normally implemented by the government. And the Office of Management and Budget in the U US uh, the Australian equivalent in, uh, back, back home, the UK, elsewhere, they have very strong p 
policy statements that said if you have any changes to regulation, it must have a cost benefit assessment. So, so when John and I you know, you know, first met and, and began discussing this, we assumed, well, surely the government has done this because you know, the Office of Management Budget says you must do it. Uh, we haven't found a, sim a single example where that has happened. The one example I thought, ah, I found one, it was about three or four years ago, and it was about the, um, the full body scanners. And there was a report done, I think it was for the Government Accountability Office. And there was about 40 pages looking at the cost. You know, how much do they cost to buy? How much do they cost to, to staff? How much power do they use? You know, how much air conditioning do they use? Enormous detail. And then there's one sentence, and then, and then there's a section on benefit. Oh, here we go. And there's one sentence that said, uh, the benefit is too difficult to quantify at this stage. And that was it. <laughs> And sure, it is difficult, but it's not impossible, you know, and, and we'll try and see how that happens. And, you know, and, and I suppose the other motivation is that, you know, 15 years after 9-11, maybe it's time we start to just re recalibrate and reflect on what's happened in the past in terms of the massive spending, and maybe some of that can be, can be wound around back. So, terrorism ha has a number of um, interesting features, and John sort of went through many of, the, of those. There's a lot of worst case thinking. If you can imagine it can happen, then it could happen. And then, then that justifies in expenditures to, to stop you know, terrorist, a, a, you know, a um, nuclear attack or, or something like that. There's a lot of, a lot of neglect about the cost. You know, we've, we've read lots of books about, about um, counterism measures and they just describe what the vulnerability is and we should close this gap and do this and do that. There's not a single dollar sign in the entire book. Not a single dollar, because often many of these are going to cost billions of dollars. A lot of neglect about the probability, as if the threat can happen. You know, um, but you need to think about this: how likelihood is an attack, and how likelihood is an attack of a certain consequence, a certain size. Risk aversion. You know, we, we see we see this we see this all the time. That there's a lot, a lot of money being being spent with little reduction in risk. So, someone is agreeing to this because they're very averse to any any risk at all. There's no, there's no appetite for risk. You know, opportunity costs can be, re can, can be something that's easily ignored. Uh, the best example is that after 9-11, there was a clear spike in traffic fatalities of between two to 400 per year. And the reason for that is that some people decided that flying was either too dangerous, they felt it was far too risky, or that the new measures of, of security at airports was so cumbersome and, you know, and, and led to very long queues that a lot of people decided they'd rather drive Know, six, six or ten hours to the destination rather than go with well, the hassle of flying. Uh, we all know that driving is much, much more dangerous than flying. So any public policy statement that encourages people to, to drive rather than fly is costing lives. It's not saving lives. And then there's a, con then there's a concept of, ex of acceptable risk. You know, no one likes a risk, but we have to weigh trade off the balances between the risk and how much it costs to reduce it. So risk aversion is, is something that um, you know, we all recognise as, as individuals. Individual, I can be risk averse. I can decide I'm not going to go downhill skiing because I think it's, I think it's bloody dangerous. I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's also no snow in Australia, so that helps as well. Um, but governments have to be you know, risk neutral. And the Office of Management and Budget and, and the equivalent in Australia and elsewhere say you, must be using you should be using average values when you estimate risk. That means, I, that means I can compare the risk of killed by a, a cyclone rather than flooding, rather than terrorism, and also the costs and benefits to actually reduce those risks. You all, I'm comparing the apples and apples, which basically means you should be using mean values. You're not, you're not thinking that, oh, the attack, one attack could cost $10 trillion because it might happen, but the probability of that is, is very low. You know, the, main, the main consequence of a terrorist attack in the West is generally the, the loss of one or two lives right? and at, at a value of maybe 20 or 30 million dollars. But what we see in, in, in Paris and, and, and Brussels are the exception. Right? They're not standard. So what, so what are the risks? So if we look at the risks over the last um, 45 years, um, we start looking at what's the annual fatality risk, so what's the annual risk of being killed by, by a terrorist, averaged over that period of time, obviously including 9-11, as John said, is about 1, 1 in 4 million. In Australia, it's about 1 in 8 million if we include the attacks in Bali. The Bali attacks killed, uh, the two attacks, they killed 92 Australians, 
Bali is very close to Australia, so we, re we really felt that was our 9-11. Uh, and so we feel that that, that was re really an, an attack on Australians. But if, if you exclude them, it's one in 50 or so million. Uh, the UK, or the, uh, Great Britain, which has a, uh, obviously a very high threat with the IRA, uh, historically, the risk is about one in, one in six million. So they're not particularly large numbers. Uh, there's about one chance in 90 million that an airline passenger will be killed by terrorists, or you have to fly for 68,000 years every day for 68,000 years before you'd be involved in a terrorist attack. And so these are very low numbers. Post, post 9-11, as John said, the risks the risk are even lower. Now what's surprising is that when, when I speak at security conferences, and, and often, often the theme is risk management or how can we do it better, either John or I are the only ones who show these numbers, who show any numbers at all. And, uh, and our view should be that those numbers should be the basis for a discussion on, on security particularly if you're concerned about should we spend more money or where should we, where should we optimise our resources. And it's almost like, you know, Sergeant Schultz saying, I know nothing. It's almost like they do not want to know what, the, what those numbers are. Now, when you look at those risks, that's the point is you can start to think, well, why are they that low? Are they that low because the existing counterterrorism measures are working? And that's probably, you know, and, and I would say, yes, that's true. And they're that low because maybe the threat is threat is very low, and I say that's true as well. Right? But then that's the point to work out well, what reason you think it is. Then you can fine tune those statistics to see what what's happening over time, and is the threat is a bombing versus shooting. You know, you, you can drill down. Just like most most um, police departments, they have very good stats about crime rates and you know and which neighbourhoods where the problems are, and that's where they put put their resources. This is this this should be exactly the same approach. So, you know, so the risks are, are very low compared to flying, driving is 4,000 times more, more, more dangerous, uh, 10 times more likely to be struck by lightning. So you'd argue that terrorism seems to pose little risk to human life in the West. You know, that might change, but that's also part of, part of discussion. You know, where's the evidence that you think that might get worse? Right? Things could actually get better. But someone who dies in a car accident has a very different effect on society than, than one or two people who get killed in a terrorist attack. There's a, there's a lot more risk aversion. People suddenly decide not to travel, and there's a lot of indirect and, and, and direct losses. So, so that's why we tend to focus more on a, on a cost-benefit analysis. Now, a cost, cost and benefit analysis is pretty obvious. You compare the cost against the benefits. Uh, the benefit is how many lives you've saved, or how many dam or how much dollar losses have you averted. And it's and it's really made, made up of, 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 of three factors. What's the probability that, the, that you get an attack that will be successful? Times the losses sustained if, if that attack was to occur. And that really gives us existing risk, like what's my expected loss or expected number of, of fatalities? And then if I'm going to spend some money on a, new, on a new security measure, how much would that reduce that risk? Is it 1% or is it 20% or 50%? Uh, and then the cost is obviously the cost of the security measure and you're comparing one, one against the other. Right? It's fairly standard stuff. Um, now, you know, it's, it's easier to convert that equation into a zillion equations you know, and, and many, many PhDs, but fundamentally, they're the three questions, we should, three questions we should be asking ourselves. So let's look at an example. We'll go through a fairly simple example with the FBI. Again, this is almost like a back of, back of the envelope calculation. Right, you wouldn't make a decision based purely on what we've done here, but a back of the envelope calculation can give you very good insights. Right, and that's one thing about engineering is that we're not always trying to get the exact answer. Right, if, I was to try to, you know, if I was to try to model the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, how that behaved under wind and loads, there'd be five or ten person years of effort just to do that, to, to get a nice, a nice accurate answer. But if you told me I have one day to, to give a rough indication of whether it's safe or not, I could, I could make some assumptions and do about three or four pages of calculations and be within 10%. I'd be pretty comfortable with, with, within, within 10%. Right? And so that's, a, that's a sort of the approach we're taking here. It just gives you a pretty good feel sort of, of where you are. So, you know, the, the, the FBI, um, um, since 9-11, counterism has been the, the highest priority and, and you can see that the funding has, has gone up from about 600 million, uh, million to nearly 3 billion 
and that's just the counterterrorism budget. It actually was quite difficult to figure out that of the whole FBI budget how much actually goes purely to, to domestic counterterrorism. So, so it, it, it's gone up by a factor of five, which is a, which is a pretty, pretty substantial increase. And so, we're, and so we would argue, well, why, why five-fold increase? Why not double it? Maybe, maybe, maybe right up to 9-11 when they double the budget, that was probably a pretty good approach to take. Nothing says it had to be increased by a factor of five. So, okay, so what's the, what's the risk reduction of the, of the FBI? And, we, and the risk reduction really is how effective are they in deterring, disrupting, or protecting against, against a terrorist attack? Would argue that they've been the major policing or security agency responsible for the foiling or deterring of most attacks in the US, both before 9-11 and after 9-11. The, the fact that the public now give lots of tips, probably too many, as John was saying, but some tips do need to be followed and they have led to arrests and, and, and so on. So would argue that you know, the FBI is, is probably a pretty efficient organisation. You know, so, so we're quite generous here that, the, that, let's say for sake of argument, that they reduce the risk by 90%. You might think it should be 80% or 95% or 99%, but you know, it's, going to be, it's going to be fairly high. So it's really saying that nine out of 10 threats would be deterred, foiled, or disrupted by, by, the, by the FBI. Start looking at, what, at, at what's the, what some of the co-benefits can be. Um, a big co-benefit is that even though they may not be able to stop a terrorist attack, they can be instrumental in rounding up the bad guys very, very quickly. And that's what happened, that's what happened in, in, in Boston. Uh, you know, for four or five days, Boston was actually shut, um, shut down, the CBD, um, I was in Washington at the time, and I, I knew people who didn't want to travel to Washington because they worried that these bombers could cause like cause like somewhere else. So the fact that there were some bombers on the loose that could cause more havoc increases the losses of that attack. So that, so the fact that they were round up very quickly minimises what the losses were in terms of business interruption, social losses, and you know, and in the process of going of going after terrorists, the FBI might well round up you know all sorts of other um, um, types of charges, but there could be some but there could be some opportunity costs, right? And that could one of them could be, for example, that more agents have been deployed to counter terrorism. There's less agents looking at, you know, criminal investigations, white collar crime, fraud, and so on. So you you might be gaining in one area, but you've actually lost resources elsewhere. Now we haven't tried to put dollar terms on this, but you just need to recognise that it's. There, there could be some co-benefits and there could be some, some opportunity costs. And in some cases, they can be very substantial, particularly the aviation security, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So what we do is we come up with a break-even analysis. And what we, uh, the question is, how high should the attack probability have to be to make sure the benefit exceeds the cost? So it's really saying it, it, it gives us a, a uh, threshold. And so, you know, so we have the same equations before. So let's assume the losses might vary from maybe $100 million from attack, which is something like the Times Square, no, to, or, or Fort Hood, to maybe uh, $5 trillion if, 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 it, if it's a newly attack at Grand Central Station or, or, or somewhere else. No, the risk reduction we think is about 90%. We'll, no, we'll put that in, the cost is about $3 billion. So the thing that's uncertain in that equation is just the probability of attacks. We basically do the back, end, the back calculation to work out what should the probability of the attack have to be for the benefit to equal the cost. Again, it's all very simple back here on envelope type, type calculations. And we come up with a table like, like this. So what we have here is we have uh, assumed risk reductions of the FBI, so we think it's about 90%. And across here we have what are the losses from different types of attack? So if you think you could be you know, thinking about a Boston type attack, then the losses might be about 500 million. Time, uh, the London bombings or Madrid bombings would be about 5 billion. 9-11 would be about 200 billion. And then you start thinking about you know, nuclear stuff and it's you know, very, very large. So this really, really gives you a, like a matrix. And you can sort of see where you think you are in that matrix. So, so, so for us, we would think that the typical threat might be something like a Boston Marathon bombing. Right? If, 
if you think that's the threat that, you, that, that you're concerned about, you think is most likely to occur, the risk reduction is 90%, then it tells us that for the $3 billion of expenditures to be cost effective, it has to be 6.7 Boston Marathon type bombings every year to justify the cost of the FBI. Now you might think, oh, well, that's been, that's not being very conservative at all because you know, the tax could be like, like London. So if you think, think that like London, uh, if that's what your intel tells you is, is, is what you think is most likely to occur, then it tells you that you need about 0.7, that you need about you know, one, nearly, nearly one at attack per year to be cost effective. But this is a table where you, know, you can determine where you think the numbers lie, rather than us saying we think it's exactly this number. Uh, if, you, if you think the risk reduction is 100%, it goes from 6.7 to 6, so it's not very really sensitive to risk reduction once you get close to 100%. So that tells you that it's, it's pretty robust. 75% is about eight attacks per year, 100% six. So there's no point spending four or five PhDs trying to figure out exactly what is the risk reduction. At the end of the day, it really doesn't change the outcome that much. So this gives you a very good feel for what are the most sensitive parameters in the model. Okay, so that's the London ones. So we then must say, well, okay, let's assume we get one attack per year. Then what would be the net benefit, right, or net present value, which is going to be the benefit minus the cost? So again, we get the same table, and this is the, uh, uh, this is the table that's in the book. And we can see that if we, again, worried about a, a Boston Marathon bombing, and we believe there's, that there'll be one uh, attack per year that would occur if we didn't, if the FBI didn't actually exist, so the FBI weren't there to actually stop an attack like that, then the net loss is $2.6 billion. Right? So it's, it's a very poor investment. If you think it's a Times Square type attack, it's probably, you know, you're losing about minus $2.1 billion. So the benefit to cost ratio is way less than one. The benefit to cost ratio here is about 0.4 to 0.5. Now, if, you're th if you think, obviously, you're going to, to, to disrupt some sort of nuclear threat, then it shows you do get a net benefit. But I we don't see too much evidence that there's, you know, particularly when John talks about the capabilities of, of terrorists, that they've really got the know-how to pull off something like that. So what we see is that, you know, Basically, $1 in cost gets about 30 cents in benefits. Right? Maybe not the best investment you can make. But, there's, and that's the nice thing about, about some of these numbers, is, is they can give, give you some insights. $3 billion sounds like a lot of money, and, and, and it probably is, but if you compare that to the total spending in the United States on domestic, count, domestic counterterrorism, that's that's getting close to 115, 120 billion dollars. So the FBI take, soaks up, you know, about about um, three percent of that budget. So you'd argue, in some ways, that maybe it's not such a large amount of money. We've also done some studies that have, and it's also in the book, that actually what we do find is cost-effective. The FBI is if the expenditures, you know, doubled post 11 to 1.2. 2 billion, which is about what the level was in um, 2003, that would seem to be an, opt an optimal amount of expenditure. Right? We have a new threat, you want to put, put resources into it, and to double the existing resources, we, we, we find in, in our calculations is, is about optimal. Once you start spending more money than that, you're spending more money and not getting that much benefit, much benefit in return. You know, and we say here, the first dollar spent on counterism measures are likely to, mo likely to be the most worthwhile. The last ones probably aren't. Some perspective, you know, the, the, the total spent on Homeland Security is actually $115 billion a year. FBI takes up about 3% of that. Uh, the pro pro that's probably the most effective 3% 3, 3 you're going to get. If we compare that to some other uh, spending, the Federal Air Marshal Service in here costs more than a billion dollars a year. The full body scans at airports, that's another billion, more than a billion dollars per year. Um, and 
John and I have done risk assessments for these, but the risk reduction is probably one or two percent at best. When I compare that to the FBI, which is 90 percent or something much, much higher. Um, and full base scanners and air marshals, they only deal with the specific threat. They don't deal with cyber threats. They don't deal with you know, active shooters or, or other threats, threats like, like that. So when you think about it you know, in those terms, you know, the FBI is probably something that's preferable in, term of, in, term, in, in term, terms of expenditure. I'm not saying we don't need the FBI, which, you know, but, it's, it's, but they, it seems that of all the other measures we, we see, the FBI are closest to being cost effective. Okay, we've done a lot of work on, on aviation security, applying similar concepts to that. And if we look at um, our threats in, in terms of hijacking attack, we've done some systems modeling. This is much more than one equation, but it's, it's still something about maybe 10 or 15 equations where we look at, at, at all the 20 layers of uh, aviation security that the TSA have. And, and when you look at all those existing layers, we think about what's the rate of deterrence and what's the rate of detection and what's the rate of disruption. When, when, when it all comes together, we find that the, the risk reduction is about 99.5%. It's pretty good. And the question then becomes, well, how close do you want to get to 100%? And how much are you, are you, are you, are you prepared to pay for that? And then this goes to John, John's point, is that obviously aviation is a pretty tough nut to crack. Right? It's, it's, it's a gold standard, and the police agencies will tell you that they see that as a gold standard you know, in, in terms of what is most attractive to terrorists to, to attack. Um, but as also John says, there's lots, lots of other less vulnerable or more highly vulnerable targets out there. So if we look at uh, just a very brief um, summary of, of some of our work, if we look at the Federal Air Marshal Service, as I said before, it costs more than a billion, a billion dollars in the US. There's two, maybe two to 4,000 air marshals. Sounds a lot. There's about 80,000 daily flights in the United States, so it doesn't go very far. Uh, they're on maybe 5% of flights. Right? And they're only there to stop a 9-11 type attack. They're not there to stop an IED attack or, or, you know, or, or, or um, an active shooter or something like that on a plane. So when we do our calculations, the, the risk reduction we work out is probably 1% at best. So when we look at the benefit to cost ratio, it's about 0.1. So it's very low. It's not cost effective. So we could double the risk reduction. We could somehow play around with, with, with some of our, our, our modeling. You're not going to get anywhere near one. It's way less than one. Secondary, secondary barriers is, is, is a proposed lightweight device to put across um, the galley, which is just before the, the, the hardened flight deck door, because the hardened flight deck door is, was put in place after 9-11 to stop, obviously, hijackers entering the cockpit. They're, they're, they weren't very expensive, but they're vulnerable. When the pilot and, and another crew come out to go to the toilet, have a coffee and, and so on, it's open. And um, I've flown on short flights in Australia you know, only one hour, and I've, the door's been open six or seven times on such a short flight. So each time it's open, you know, maybe a potential terrorist could, could force their way in at that stage. So th this is a lightweight device, very cheap, much higher reduction risk, and the benefit cost ratio is 63, but it's, it could be 80 or 30, you know, it, but it's a very large number. Um, there's a program where some flight deck crew can be armed, and there's a tra training program where that can happen. Um, that costs about $25 million. This is a program that the TSA are actually trying to cut. The last three or four budgets, they've actually tried to cut this. Yet it's very cheap. Risk reduction is more than double what you get on air marshal service because these armed pilots, they're on about 15 or 25% of flights. So they have a much greater coverage on flights than, than air marshals. And after 9-11, and after we know the flow crew are going to fight for their lives. They're not going to hand over a plane like, like what happened before 9-11. So again, that, 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 has a, that has a very high benefit to cost ratio. So, 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 so FAMS, or the Air Marshal Service, has the highest cost with the, with the least amount of risk, risk reduction. And this is a program that is ripe to, cut, you know, to actually cut back. 
not that not that it should be disbanded. We should have some on the books, but you don't need four thousand of them at such a high cost. Uh, and 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 other countries have been winding back their air marshal programs. Uh, close on close on on um, pre-check, which which is like like the latest type of security in the TSA. Um, if you if you're eligible for, for pre-check, you can keep your shoes on, keep laptops on, liquid stays in the bags, laptop stays in the bags. It's fantastic. It's really going to security what it was pre pre 11 and something like 50% of passengers are now eligible for uh, pre pre check. So that means they they go through the screening lanes much much quicker. There's less queues. There's a lot less disruption. Those who aren't in pre check still have to go through the regular screening. And the theory is that the, because you now go through regular screening, there's less people going through those channels, there's more time to actually spend assessing um, these, the safety of those people who go through. So you meant to, so you, you should hope to get an increased reduction in risk in the regular lanes. But there will be a decrease, obviously, if people go in risk, obviously, if they go through pre-check. Pre this is a program where clearly there's been a reduction in, 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 in security. Public love it. Government likes it, so it's a case where finally we've seen some 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 common sense, and pre-check is really based upon risk, right? So people can enrol in the program if they have oh, there's all sorts of criteria, but basically they'll be low risk. They'll be they'll be frequent flyers, no criminal record, no flying, no whatever. There's lots of ways to to look at that. Basically, we would argue that probably 99.9999 percent of people are low risk when it comes to flying. In, here or, or, or elsewhere. So it saves the TSA about, about $100 million a year because you need less screeners because more people are going through the faster screening. So the TSA are saving money. But more importantly, the co benefit is enormous because if you improve the passenger experience, they're more likely to fly right, or less likely to drive. Um, and so the airports and airlines like, like it. Um, so it, 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 it seems to me, us to be a win-win situation and John and I are working on, on a project at the moment to, to more accurately define what these, what these risks and, and costs actually are. But the results at the moment are looking very encouraging and my mission in life is to get pre-check in Australia because <laughs> it is such a fantastic experience to have and, and we're hoping that this will be a, be a, a model for, for, for other countries. So, you know, so a cost-benefit assessment, it's um, evidence-based, you know, and that's really important. Right? You have the numbers, you can then, again, discuss whether you think the reduction should be higher or lower, or maybe deterrent rate should be higher than what you assumed, but that's a basis and it's a framework, and it's transparent. It's, it's not just, just me saying, I know stuff, I can't tell you, just trust me, this is, what, this, this is what we should do. It's actually very, very transparent. What we're finding is, is that police and, and intel, maybe a little bit less so, is likely to be the most cost effective compared to protective measures. So my background being a structural engineer, a lot of my colleagues spent the whole career designing buildings so, so a bomb isn't going to damage it or designing buildings so that um, you, know, air, you know, planes can crash into them and still survive and putting up bollards and you know, pr protective barriers. And it's great stuff, but it, it doesn't pass the cost-benefit analysis because the threat is actually so low, unless it's a government building or something where, there, where there's going to be a specific threat. Because there's a zillion targets. You harden one building and I'll just go down the street and find one that isn't, isn't hardened. So the, so the whole displacement effect is something that never really seems to be much, uh, discussed amongst the security community at all. And, you know, and, and we think it's really time to just, just, just reflect a bit more deeply about what, about what we're spending and how we spend it. So, so thank you very much. Thank you.